The Magic Mirror Lesson 4a Supplement to Diagnosis Since humans degenerated through civilization, they no longer know what to do when they become sick. Disease remains the same mystery to modern medical science as it was to the medicine man of thousands of years ago. The main difference being that the germ theory has replaced the demon, and that mysterious outside power remains to harm you and destroy your life. Disease is a mystery to you as well as to every doctor who has not as yet looked into the magic mirror, which I am about to explain. Naturopathy deserves full credit for having proven that disease is within you, a foreign matter which has weight, and which must be eliminated. If you want to become your own physicians, or if you are a drugless healer and you want more success, you must learn the truth and know what diseases are. You cannot heal yourself or other people without an exact diagnosis, which will give you a clear idea of true conditions. This infallible truth can be learned only from the book of nature, that is, through a test on your own body, or the magic mirror as I have designated it. The sufferer from any kind of disease, or any person, whether sick or not, who will go through the healing process of fasting and mucusless diet, will eliminate mucus, thereby demonstrating that the basic cause of all latent diseases of humans are a clogged-up tissue system of uneliminated, unused, and undigested food substances. Through the magic mirror, a true and unfailing diagnosis of your disease is furnished, as never before. The Magic Mirror Number 1. Proof that your personal, individual symptom, sore, or sensation, according to what your disease is named, is nothing more than an extraordinary local accumulation of waste. 2. The coated tongue is evidence of a constitutional encumbrance throughout the entire system, which obstructs and congests the circulation by dissolved mucus, and this mucus even appears in the urine. Number 3. The presence of unevacuated feces retained through sticky mucus in the pockets of the intestines, constantly poisoning and thereby interfering with proper digestion and blood building. To look inside your body far better and clearer than can be done by doctors with expensive X-ray apparatus, and learn the cause of your disease, or even discover some hitherto unknown physical imperfection or mental condition, try this. Fast one or two days, or eat fruits only, such as oranges, apples, or any juicy fruit in season, for two or three days, and you will notice that your tongue will become heavily coated. When this happens to the acutely sick, the doctor's conclusion is always indigestion. The tongue is the mirror not only of the stomach, but of the entire membrane system as well. The fact that this heavy coating returns, even if removed by tongue scraper once or twice a day, is an accurate indication of the amount of filth, mucus, and other poisons accumulated in the tissues of your entire system, now being eliminated on the inside surface of the stomach, intestines, and every cavity of your body. You will become further convinced of this fact of this diagnosis of your disease, by another surprise in store for you, if you will empty your intestines both before and after the test. During the fast you are truly on nature's operating table without the use of a knife. The cleansing eliminating process begins immediately, and the knowledge contained in these lessons provide the needed information necessary to secure the desired results. After you have fasted, it is advisable to decrease the quantity of your customary amount of food and eat only natural, cleansing, mucusless foods, fruits and starchless vegetables, thereby affording the body an opportunity to loosen and eliminate mucus, which is, in fact, the healing process. This mirror on the tongue surface reveals to the observer the amount of encumbrance that has been clogging up the system since childhood through wrong, mucus-forming foods. After observing the urine during this test by allowing it to stand for a few hours, you will note the elimination of quantities of mucus in the same. The actual amount of filth and waste, which is the mysterious cause of your trouble, is almost unbelievable. Every disease is first a special, local constipation of the circulation, tissues, pipe system, and hence the manifestation of symptoms, or of the different symptoms. If painful and inflamed, it is from overpressure, heat or inflammation caused by friction and congestion. Second, disease, every disease, is constitutional constipation. The entire human pipe system, especially the microscopically small capillaries, is chronically constipated through the wrong food of civilization, 
white blood corpuscles are waste, and there is no man or woman in Western civilization who has mucus-free blood and mucus-free blood vessels. It is like the soot in a stovepipe, which has never been cleaned. In fact, worse, because the waste from protein and starchy foods is sticky. The characteristics of tissue construction, especially of the important internal organs, such as the lungs, kidneys, all glands, etc., are very much similar to those of a sponge. Imagine a sponge soaked in paste or glue. Naturopathy must cleanse its science from medical superstitions, wrongly called scientific diagnosis. Nature alone is the teacher of a standard science of truth. She heals through one thing, fasting, every disease that is possible to heal. This alone is proof that nature recognizes but one disease, and that in every body the largest factors are always waste, foreign matter, and mucus, besides uric acid and other toxemias, and very often pus if tissues are decomposed. In order to realize how terribly clogged up the human body is, one must have seen thousands of people who fast, as I have. The almost inconceivable fact is, how can such quantities of waste be stored up in the body? Have you ever stopped to realize that masses of phlegm you expelled during a cold? And just as it is taking place in your head, your bronchial tubes, lungs, stomach, kidneys, bladder, etc., have the same appearance? All are in the same condition, and the spongy organ known as the tongue accurately mirrors on its surface the appearance of every other part of your body. Medicine has devised a special science of laboratory tests, urinal diagnoses, and blood tests. More than fifty years ago, the most prominent pioneers of naturopathy said, Every disease is foreign matter, waste. I said twenty years ago, and repeated again and again, that most of these foreign matters are paste produced from the wrong foods, decomposed, to be seen when it leaves the body as mucus. Meat decomposes into pus. The light of truth dawned upon me after I had fasted against the will of the naturopath from whom I was taking treatments for Bright's disease. When the test tube filled up with albumin, I read his thoughts in his facial expression. But to me, it proved that whatever nature expels, eliminates, is waste. Whether it be albumin, sugar, mineral salts, or uric acid, this occurred to me more than twenty-four years ago. But this nature doctor, a former M.D., still believes in the replacement of albumin in high-protein foods. The medical diagnosis of Bright's disease when the chemical test of urine shows a high percentage of albumin is as misleading as the others are. The elimination of albumin proves that the body does not need it, that it is overfed, overloaded, with high-protein stuff. Instead of decreasing these poison-producing foods, they are wrongly increased, endeavoring to replace the loss until the patient dies. How tragic to replace waste while nature is endeavoring to save you by removing it. The next important laboratory test is that of sugar in the urine, diabetes. The medical dictionary still calls it mysterious, instead of eating natural sweets, which go into the blood, and which can be used. The diabetic patient is fed eggs, meat, bacon, etc., and, in fact, actually starves to death through lack of natural sugar-containing and sugar-producing foods which have been withheld. It has long been proven that all of these blood tests, especially the Wasserman test, are a fallacy. We as naturopaths cannot ignore nature's teaching in any way. Even though we may find it difficult to discard old errors hammered into us since childhood. One of the most misleading errors is the individual naming of all diseases. The name of any disease is not important and not of any value whatsoever when starting a natural cure, especially through fasting and diet. If every disease is caused through foreign matters, as it most assuredly is, then it is only important and necessary to know how great and how much the amount of the patient's encumbrance actually is, how far and how much their system is clogged up by foreign matters, how much their vitality has become lowered, see Lesson 5, and in case of tuberculosis or cancer, if the tissues themselves are decomposed, pus and germs. I have had hundreds of cases tell me, that every doctor they called upon gave a different diagnosis and correspondingly different name for their ailment. I always surprise them by saying, I know exactly what ails you through facial diagnosis and you will see it for yourself in the magic mirror within a few days. The Experimental Diagnosis Just as I have already stated in the beginning of this lesson, you must fast for two or three days. 
The surface of the tongue will clearly indicate the appearance on the inside of the body, and the patient's breath will prove the amount and grade of decomposition. It is even possible to tell the kind of food they preferred most. Should pain be felt at any one place during the beginning of the fast, you may be sure that this is a weak point, and the symptom is not sufficiently developed for medical doctors to reveal it through their examination. Waste will show up in the urine with clouds of mucus, and mucus will be expelled from the nose, throat, and lungs, as well as in the feces. The weaker and more miserable the patient may feel during the fast, the greater is his or her encumbrance, and the weaker his or her vitality. This experimental diagnosis tells you exactly what the trouble is and how to correct it by starting with a moderate transition diet or a more radical one and whether to continue or discontinue the fast. This experiment is the foundation, the basis of the development of the science of nature cure, physics, chemistry, etc. It is the question put to nature and she replies with the same infallible answer, always and everywhere. If a patient becomes nervous, or symptoms of heart trouble occur, you may be sure that they have drugs stored up in their body. A consumptive patient starts with such terrible elimination after a short fast that it must be plain to all how ignorant and how impossible it is to try and cure him with good nourishing foods, such as eggs and milk. The above explanation is the experimental diagnosis, and the only scientific one. You cannot secure a better view inside than by this simple method. No expensive apparatus can show more accurately the exact conditions as they exist inside the body. All other examination, including iris diagnosis, diagnosis of the spine, etc., are never exact, and therefore not dependable. Nature's mirrors, her revelations, her demonstrations, and her phenomena are magic only so long as you lack the correct interpretation of them. Nature shows and plainly reveals to you everything far more exact, perfect, and better than all, science of diagnosis put together. The Prognosis of Disease And now we come to the prognosis of disease. We hear of latent disease. Everyone, no matter to what extent they may enjoy good health, has a latent sickness. And nature only awaits an opportunity to eliminate the waste stored up since childhood and on. Everyone knows but fails to understand that a severe shock, such as a cold or influenza over the entire body, starts an elimination. But unfortunately, nature is handicapped in her attempted house cleaning through the doctor's advice to continue eating, through the use of drugs, etc., obstructing elimination and producing acute and chronic diseases. Anyone, even though not sick, especially in the critical stage between 30 and 40 years old, may fast a few days and through the magic mirror learn the extent of their latent disease and where their weak point is located, as well as the name of their latent disease and where it will appear. That is the prognosis of disease, and if life insurance companies would only believe in it, would furnish a true and safe method of determining risks. Fasting until the tongue is clean is dangerous. Who can explain why the tongue becomes clean after breaking a short fast with a square meal and why the magic mirror shows more waste if you live on fruits or mucusless diet after the fast. This is the hitherto unexplained mystery of the magic mirror, and the simple explanation is that the elimination is stopped for a while through the eating of wrong foods, and as a result you feel better for a time with wrong foods than with fruits. And during this period, even the magic mirror apparently leads you into thinking the body is clean. A return to natural foods soon proves otherwise. For the ordinary person, it will require from one to three years of systematically continued fasting and natural cleansing diet before the body is actually cleansed of foreign matters. You may then see how the body is constantly eliminating waste through the entire outside surface of the body, from every pore of the skin, the urinal canal, and the colon, from the eyes and ears, and from the nose and throat. You can see how wet as well as dry mucus, dandruff for instance, is being expelled. All diseases, therefore, are immense quantities of waste, chronically stored up, and through this artificial elimination of chronic disease, you will agree with me and realize that I am not exaggerating when I state the diagnosis of your disease, of all diseases of humankind, both mental and physical, since the beginning of civilization, proves that they all have the same foundational cause, whatever the symptoms may be. It is, without exception, one and the same general and universal condition, a oneness of all disease, that is, waste, foreign matter, mucus and its poisons, 
Internal impurity is too mild an expression for chronic constipation. Waste, filth, mucus, stench, offensive odor, or invisible waste are the true descriptions. Lesson 4a Footnotes Number 1. Earlier in the text, Eret critiques naturopathy, suggesting that it does not explain sufficiently the source, nature, and composition of foreign matters as the fundamental oneness of all disease. See naturopathic concepts. Yet, Eret does identify himself as a naturopath. Essentially, he contributes a much-needed perspective to the discipline. Eret's methods may be viewed as true naturopathy. Number 2. In most cases, liquid should be used during the fast. For full instructions on how to fast safely and effectively, see Fasting Lessons Part 1 through 4. Number 3. Not only is fasting until the tongue is free of mucus dangerous, but depending upon the quantity of your internal uncleanliness, it can be near impossible early in your transition. Number 4. The magic mirror can be a very helpful and enlightening tool to understand and use, yet it is important to put it into its proper perspective and not obsess over it. As Eric says, your goal should not be to try to fast all of the mucus off your tongue at once. It takes years, perhaps decades, to totally clean the body to the point where your tongue will not secrete excess mucus. Yet, the magic mirror can remind us that our body is one whole organism, and not merely a collection of unrelated parts. In Western society, we have been conditioned to think about the body as a bunch of individual parts. Bones, organs, vessels, etc. can become compartmentalized in our consciousness. Yet, the mucus that is secreted from your tongue is the same that is being secreted along the walls of your stomach, intestines, and colon. Your entire digestive tract may be viewed as one long, continuous tube that goes from your mouth to your colon. Many people wonder why they end up with a mouthful of mucus after eating fruit. This causes some to erroneously believe that the fruit is causing the mucus. Now, you may understand that the astringent properties of the fruit are pulling on the mucus membrane and causing the release of excess mucus. If your body is encumbered with waste, then the release of mucus in this way is necessary. Yet, as you rid your body of mucus, this kind of elimination happens less and less. Number 5. Many beginners of the mucusless diet wonder how long it will take to totally cleanse the body. Eret says, for the ordinary person, it will require from 1 to 3 years of systematically continued fasting and natural cleansing diet before the body is actually cleansed of foreign matters. However, this statement is often misinterpreted to mean that it will only take 1 to 3 years to reach the highest levels of a mucusless lifestyle. In actuality, transitioning for 1 to 3 years is only the beginning of the process. If you have followed the program within the first several years, you should have eliminated the pounds of excess fecal matter from your bowels and started to deeply cleanse on the cellular level. But, based on the experiences of many long-term practitioners of the mucusless diet, it takes decades to totally cleanse the body and reach the highest levels. Yet, this should not deter you, as I suggest that you not be concerned with how long the diet will take. Time is relative to each person, and we did not produce our physical ailments overnight. We must make compensation for the past, and it will take time. The key is to keep transitioning. The Formula of Life Lesson 5 The Secret of Vitality V equals P minus O is the formula of life, and at the same time, you may call it the formula of death. V stands for vitality. P, or call it X, the unknown quantity in this question, is the power that drives the human machinery, which keeps you alive, which gives you strength and efficiency, endurance for, as yet an unknown length of time without food. O means obstruction, encumbrance, foreign matter, toxemias, mucus, in short, all internal impurities which obstruct the circulation the function of internal organs especially, and the human engine in its entire functioning system. You can therefore see through this equation that as soon as O becomes greater than P, the human machine must come to a standstill. The engineer can figure exactly E equals P minus F, meaning that the amount of energy or efficiency E he or she secures from an engine is not equal to the power P without first deducting F, the friction. The ingenious idea of construction of the ideal engine is to make it work with the smallest amount of friction. Should we transfer this fundamental and principal idea to the human engine, we see that it involves the terrible ignorance of medical physiology, and that naturopathy found a true way of healing 
by removing or eliminating obstructions, that is, foreign matters of encumbrance, mucus, and its toxemias. But just what vitality really is and how tremendous it can become, what a higher, superior, absolute help is, has not up to the present date been shown or proven. I will teach in the following lessons a principally different new physiology, based on the correction of medical errors of blood circulation, blood composition, blood building, and metabolism. For this purpose, it is necessary that you first learn what vitality, what animal life, really is. It is generally admitted that the secret of vitality, the secret of animal life, is unknown to science. It will surprise you when shown the truth through a simple, natural enlightenment, and you must admit at once that it is the truth. Always remember this fact. Whatever cannot be seen, conceived at once, through simple reasoning, is humbug and not science. The human engine must first be seen before all other physiological considerations as an air-gas engine, constructed in its entirety, with the exception of the bones, from rubber-like, very elastic, spongy material called flesh and tissues. The next fact is that its function is that of a pump system by air pressure, and with an inside circulation of liquids, such as the blood and other saps, and that the lungs are the pump and the heart is the valve, and not the opposite, as erroneously taught by medical physiology for the past four hundred years. A further fact, one that has been almost entirely overlooked, is the automatic atmospheric outside counter-pressure, which is over fourteen pounds to the square inch. Immediately upon and after each out-breath, a vacuum is created in the lung cavity. In other words, the human body-animal organism in its entirety functions automatically by inhaling air pressure and expelling chemically changed air and outside atmospheric counter-pressure on the vacuums of the body. That is, vitality, animal life in the first instance and importance. That is, P, power, which keeps you alive, and without air you cannot live five minutes. But the unseen fact, let us say the secret, is that it works simply and automatically through atmospheric counter-pressure, which is only possible because the engine consists of elastic, spongy material with a vital strain power, with an ability of vibration, expansion, and contraction. Those two facts were the unknown secrets concerning the automatic function of P, as the phenomena of vitality. The chemist, Hensel, has proven through chemical physiological formulas that this special vital elasticity of the tissues is due to a lime-sugar combination. The Latin word spira means first air, and then spirit. The breath of God is in fact first, good fresh air. It has been said that breathing is life, and it is true that you develop vitality, health, through physical and breathing exercises. It is also true that you can remove O, obstruction, by higher air pressure and counter-pressure in this way. It is true that you remove and eliminate obstructions of foreign matter by local and constitutional vibrations, consisting of all kinds of physical treatments. It is true that you eliminate disease matters and obstructions, and therefore relieve every kind of disease through an artificial speeding of the circulation, giving more air gas and vibrating the tissues. You increase P, power, artificially for a certain time, but you decrease the vital ability of the function of counter-pressure, weakening the rubber-like elasticity of the tissues. In other words, you increase P, but not V. To the contrary, this is done and can be done only at the expense of V. You know from experience what happens to a rubber band continually stretched or overexpanded. It loses its elasticity. You relieve diseases, but you slowly lower vitality particularly of the especially elastic and spongy important organs of the lung, liver, kidney, etc. You relieve but do not heal diseases perfectly. You lower vitality just so long as you loosen, remove, and eliminate obstructions exclusively through political means, agents, and just so long as you do not stop the supply, the taking in of waste, of obstruction by wrong mucus forming, that is, disease building, and natural foods you lower vitality. Would anyone attempt to clean an engine through a continually higher speed in shaking? No. You would first flush with a dissolving liquid and then change your fuel supply. Should it be a steam engine, the obstructions through waste being caused through the coal only partly burning. This involves the problem of dietetics, which culminates in the solution of these questions over its history. Which are the best foods? Meaning, which foods give the most energy, endurance, health, and increased vitality? 
or which foods are the basic cause of diseased conditions and growing old? What is the essence of life, of vitality, breathing exercise, activity, a perfect mind, or right food? My formula, the equation shown in the heading, gives the enlightening answer and solves the problem in its entire mystery. Decrease O first by decreasing quantities of food of all kinds, or even food entirely, fast, if conditions tell you. Second, stop or decrease at least, by all means, obstruction-causing, mucus-forming foods, and increase dissolving, eliminating, obstruction-removing foods, and you increase P, meaning a more unobstructed function of P, of air pressure, of the infinite, inexhaustible power source. In other words, the problem of vitality and animal life functioning at all consist of unobstructed, perfect circulation by air pressure, and of a vital elasticity of the tissues through proper food as the necessary counterpressure for the function of life. P is infinite, unlimited, and practically the same everywhere, and on every body, continually the same. But its activity slows down in the tempo, speed, as you accumulate obstructions, as you overeat and eat wrongly, lowering the automatic counterpressure of the tissues. You may now see that vitality does not depend immediately, directly, and primarily from food or from a right diet. If you eat too much of the best ones, especially in a body full of waste and poisons, it is impossible for them to enter your bloodstream in a clean state and become efficiency-giving vital substances. They are mixed with and poisoned by mucus and autotoxemias and actually lower vitality. They increase O instead of P. You now see and you may realize very deeply that it is worthless to figure food values with the intention of increasing P or V as long as the body is full of O. This problem is solved by my system, consisting of periodical minor fasting, alternating with cleansing, not nourishing, mucusless and mucus-poor menus. Not as wrongly done with the idea that V is directly increased on a sick person through feeding clean food. Remove O through intelligent, personally prescribed menus. P increases automatically after a fast, through its unobstructed function. You can now realize how wrong and insufficient it is for people to think that all there is to the mucusless diet is knowing the right foods. Here, then, is the cause why so many fasting, fruit diet, etc. cures fail. The inexperienced layperson always comes to the death point. In other words, he or she removes O oh, too rapidly, too much at once, and feels fine for a while. The dissolving process goes deeper. O oh, increases, they feel terribly weak, fall back on wrong diet, and thus this wrong diet stops the elimination of more obstructions, feels well again, blames the food for their weakness, and sees the wrong food as the food of vital efficiency. They lose their faith and tell you in all sincerity, I have tried it, but it is wrong. They blame the system, entirely ignorant regarding it, when they alone are to blame. Here is the stumbling block even of other diet experts and naturopaths experimenting in dietetics. Lesson 7 will divulge this secret. Some have had more experiences, but very few think as I do that vitality, energy, and strength are not derived from food at all. They believe it is acquired through sleep, etc. What I have learned and what I know through years of experimenting and what I have actually demonstrated can be found in my book, Rational Fasting, but briefly stated it is this. First, vitality does not descend primarily and directly from food, but rather from the facts of how far and how much the function of the human engine is obstructed, braked by obstructions of mucus and toxemias. Second, removing O by artificially increasing P and shaking, vibrating tissues through physical treatments is done at the expense of V, vitality. Third, vital energy, physical and mental efficiency, endurance, superior health by P, air and water alone are tremendous beyond imagination, as soon as P works and can work without O, without obstruction and friction in a perfectly clean body. Fourth, the limit of going without food and before solid food is necessary under such ideal conditions is yet unknown. Fifth, the composition of P besides air, oxygen, and a certain quantity of water steam increases but only in a clean body by the following other agents from the infinite. Electricity, ozone, light, especially sunlight, and odor, good smells of fruits and flowers. Further, it is not impossible that under such clean, natural conditions, nitrogen of the air may be assimilated. In the following lesson, I teach you a new but true physiology of the body, 
which is necessary to know in order to understand why and how the mucusless diet healing system works in its complete perfection. And for this purpose, it was first necessary to lift the veil from the secret, from the mystery of vitality. Lesson 5 Footnotes Number 1. Dr. Julius Hensel, 1844-1903, through 1903, was a pioneering agriculturalist, chemist, and author of Bread from Stones and Life, Its Foundations and the Means for Its Preservation, a Physical Explanation for the Practical Application of Agriculture, Forestry, Nutrition, and the Functions of Life, Health and Disease, and General Welfare, the latter of which is quoted by Eret in Lesson 8 of the Mucusless Diet Healing System. Number 2. The word spirit is from the mid-thirteenth century, first meaning the animating or vital principle in man and animals, the old French esprit, and from the Latin spiritus, meaning soul, courage, vigor, breath, related to spirare or spiro, meaning to breathe. Number three, Eret offers the equation vitality equals power minus obstruction as an eloquent solution to the most injurious dietetic and physiological paradox in history. The belief that our body needs to consume so-called nutritious materials that will ultimately promote its death. He criticizes many commonly held theories of metabolism, protein, and nutrition, and offers new physiological explanations derived from experimenting with his mucus theory. Eret's findings suggest that our bodies do not need to take in substances that cause illness to live, and that pus and mucus-forming foods are the greatest proponents of human illness. Thus, the most fundamental human right is that we do not need to consume harmful, mucus-forming foods. In other words, we need not consume that which is unnecessary and damaging to human life. Instead of being obsessed with eating nutritiously, Eret asserts that our focus should be on the most fundamental aspect of human life, which is breathing and the natural elimination of internal waste. What is meant by V equals P minus O, vitality equals power minus obstruction, it is an equation devised by Eret that he calls the formula of life. Eret's proposition is that the human body is a perpetual motion air-gas engine that is powered exclusively by oxygen, and that the body ceases to function when obstructed with waste. He asserts that mucus-forming foods create obstruction in the human body, and that a diet consisting of starchless, fat-free fruits and green, leafy vegetables is the only diet that does not leave behind obstructive residues in the body and will aid the body in the process of natural healing. If these acidic obstructions are not able to be eliminated from the body, the deterioration of internal organs becomes almost inevitable. If you were to put sand into a gas tank of your car, how far do you think your car would go? If your car engine is caked with gunk because you have not had the oil changed in years, how well does the car work? Chances are, it would work much better if gasoline was used instead of sand, and the gunk obstruction was eliminated with a good oil change. If the basic laws are ignored, the obstruction in the engine becomes too great, and it cannot function and ultimately stops, dies. The engine of your body acts the same way. Your body is an air-gas engine that was never designed to take in mucus-forming foods. Over time, these mucus-forming foods create so much obstruction that your body can no longer receive efficient amounts of oxygen into the bloodstream. This obstruction is then given some name, such as heart attack, stroke, high cholesterol, etc. To describe this basic principle, Air created the equation vitality equals power minus obstruction, i.e., V equals P minus O. As soon as obstruction O becomes greater than the body's power P, deriving from the breath, the body comes to a standstill. It takes many people a great deal of time to truly understand vitality equals power minus obstruction. It is very simple yet elegant and profound. People often ask the difference between vitality and power, more specifically how power should be defined. Energy slash vitality is the ability to do work, i.e., the more energy a device has, the more work it can do. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only changed or diverted. Power is the amount of work that can be done within a particular unit of time. Obstruction is the friction that prevents this work from functioning properly, therefore negatively impacting energy slash vitality. In sum, energy slash vitality is what is transferred, and power is the rate at which it is delivered. In physics, Power is the rate at which energy is transferred, used, or transformed. In this equation, vitality may be likened to energy, and obstruction to friction, i.e. energy equals power minus friction. From Eret's perspective, power is the unknown constant, and the rate of its transfer is based on the amount of friction afforded by an obstructing medium. Essentially, vitality equals power would suggest that the human body is a perpetual motion air-gas machine, 
that continues indefinitely without any external source of energy or change. In other words, the motion of a hypothetical machine that, once activated, would run indefinitely unless subject to an external force or to wear. The New Physiology Lesson 6 As you now know what vitality is and how simply animal life functions automatically by air pressure and air counterpressure, on fish, etc., it acts exactly the same, by water instead of air. You may realize that medical physiology, the science of animal functions, is fundamentally wrong based on the following errors which have to be corrected by a new physiology. Number 1. The theory of blood circulation. Number 2. Metabolism of the change of matter. Number 3. High protein foods. Number 4. Blood composition. And number 5. Blood building. The error of blood circulation. Medical physiology, pathological physiology, continues to find diseases, i.e., the cause of disease, with the microscope and germ theory is now fashionable. They will never find the truth and never understand what disease is, as long as they have a fundamentally wrong conception of blood circulation. As I have already explained, the fact has been overlooked that the lungs are the motoric organs of circulation, and the circulating blood drives the heart, the same as the regulating valve in an engine. That the bloodstream drives the heart and not the opposite can be seen through the two following facts. Number one, as soon as you increase air pressure by increased breathing, you speed the circulation and therefore the number of heartbeats. Number two, as soon as you take into the circulation a stimulating poison, alcohol for example, you increase the speed of the heart. As soon as you take a nerve and a muscle band paralyzing poison, for example digitalis, you decrease the speed of the heart. The medical profession has this exact knowledge, but in spite of their knowledge, arrives at the wrong conclusion that a mysterious power acts on the heart muscle driving the blood circulation. Prominent engineers among my patients agreed with my concept after learning this new physiology, saying that the heart would make a model valve for any kind of engine. How can it be logically proven that the heart controls the circulation if through the circulating blood you can't control the heart. Increased air pressure through climbing a hill or running increases heart action for the speed of the valve, as in an engine, depends upon the pressure. Thirty years ago, a Swiss expert of physiology, although a lay person, demonstrated evidentially with animal experiments that a circulation as taught by physiology and as originated by Professor William Harvey in London 400 years ago does not exist at all. Of course, no attention was given by medicine to his demonstrations. How can a science be erroneous? Metabolism Metabolism, or the science of the change of matter, is the most absurd and the most dangerous doctrine teaching ever imposed on humankind. It is the father of the wrong cell theory and of that most erroneous albumin theory, which will kill and stamp out the entire civilized Western world if its following is not stopped. It will kill you, too, some day, if you fail to accept the truth that a continual albumin replacement is unnecessary and that you cannot gain vitality, efficiency, and health by protein as long as your human engine has to work against obstructions, which are in fact the cause of death of all humankind of the Western civilization. The erroneous idea that the cells of the body are continually used up by the process of life in their essential substance of protein and must be continually replaced by high-protein foods, can be and are evidentially refuted by my investigations, experiments, and observations on some hundred fasters. The facts are as follows, and you will again see that it is just as I teach and as I have experienced. What medicine calls and views as metabolism is the elimination of waste by the body as soon as the stomach is empty. Medicine actually believes that you live from your own flesh substance as soon as you are fasting. Even Dr. Kellogg believed that the vegetarian becomes a meat eater when he or she fasts, and naturopathy has taken over, more or less, in principle these medical errors. One believes that the human engine cannot run a minute without solid food, protein, and fat, and makes the erroneous conclusion that humans die and must die from starvation as soon as all their fat and protein is used up during a fast. I found and have this to state. Lean people can fast easier and longer than fat ones. The Hindu fakir, consisting of skin and bones, the leanest type in existence, 
can fast the longest time and without suffering. Where is there any using up of the body in this instance? I further found that the cleaner the body from waste, mucus, the easier and longer one can fast. Therefore, a fast has to be prepared for by an eliminating and laxative diet. My world record of watched fasting of 49 days could be done under the conditions imposed only after using a strict mucusless diet during a long period of time. In other words, I could stand this long fast, and you could stand a fast much easier and much longer the more the body is free from fat, which is partly decomposed watery flesh, the more the body is free from mucus and poisons, which are eliminated as soon as eating is stopped, entirely or partly. The human body does not expel, burn up, or use up a single cell that is in vital condition. The cleaner, the freer from obstructions, from waste the body is, the easier and the longer you can fast with water and air alone. The limit where real starvation sets in is yet unknown. The Catholic Church claims test of holy people who fasted during decades. But the medical error even grows by teaching metabolism, claiming that you must replace cells, which are not used up as you can plainly see, with high-protein food from a cadaver, partly decomposed meat, and which has gone through a most destructive process of cooking. The fact is that you accumulate more or less of the waste in your system in the shape of mucus and its poisons as the slowly growing foundation of your disease and the ultimate cause of your death. Human imagination is evidently not sufficient to conceive the tremendous foolishness of this doctrine and its consequences, unmindful that its teachings are actually said to kill the individual and to finally kill all humankind. Medicine, and the average person, of course, also believes that you are growing flesh and increasing good health if you daily increase your weight by good eating. If the colon of a so-called healthy fat man or woman is cleansed of their accumulated feces, even though they have regular stools, he or she at once loses from 5 to 10 pounds of the weight called health. Weight of feces figured by doctors as health, can you imagine anything more erroneous, more wrong, more foolish, and at the same time, more dangerous to your health and life? That is the medical science of metabolism. Lesson 6. Footnotes. Number 1. William Harvey, 1578-1657, was an English physician and professor noted for being the first to completely describe the systematic circulation and properties of human blood in detail. However, earlier writers had provided precursors of the theory. Number 2. Albumin theory, or nitrogenous albumin metallic theory, reports that humans must eat protein-rich, pus and mucus-forming foods to provide fuel for, rebuild, and sustain the body. Number 3. John Harvey Kellogg, 1852-1943, through 1943, was an American medical doctor in Battle Creek, Michigan, who ran a sanitarium using holistic methods with a particular focus on diet, enemas, and exercise. Kellogg was an advocate of vegetarianism, and is best known for the invention of the Corn Flakes breakfast cereal with his brother, Will Keith Kellogg. Number 4. The term vegetarian refers to a variety of dietetic modalities that include the eating of plant-based foods, fruits and vegetables, and certain mucus-forming foods, starches or grains and fats. Some vegetarians may or may not also choose to include pus-forming foods, such as dairy products, eggs, or fish. 5. The additive principle is a term used by modern-day practitioners of the mucusless diet healing system to refer to the belief that humans need to consume, accumulate, and use various forms of material matter to exist. Modern theories of nutrition and metabolism emerge from an additive concept, whereby it is thought that the human body must take in and metabolize various elements not obtained through the process of breathing to live. Eret rejects the foundation of the additive principle and proposes his formula to life, vitality equals power minus obstruction, which asserts that human life exists as a result of the non-accumulation and elimination of unnecessary matter. Therefore, Emphasis is put on using food to help the body eliminate waste rather than obtaining nutrition. Number 6. A fakir is an ascetic mendicant or holy person, especially one who performs feats of endurance, rejects worldly pleasures, and lives solely on alms. The New Physiology, Part 2, Lesson 7 High-Protein Foods when the movement for naturopathy and a meatless diet began in the 19th century, medical scientists were endeavoring to prove by mathematical figures that physical and mental efficiency have to be kept up through daily replacement of protein. 
with a certain quantity for the average human. In other words, it became fashionable, a mania, to suggest and do exactly the opposite of nature's laws whenever a person felt weak, tired rapidly, or became exhausted or sick in any way. You know now, through Lesson 5, the source of vitality and efficiency. You also now know that the strength of a sick body can be increased when foods are not eaten, especially protein. High-protein foods act as stimulation for a certain time because they decompose at once in the human body into poison. It is a commonly known fact that any kind of animal substance becomes very poisonous as soon as it enters into oxidation with air, especially at a higher temperature as exists in the human body. The learned have gone so far as to prove that humans belong biologically in the class of meat-eating animals, while the descendant theory proves that they belong to the ape family who are exclusively fruit-eaters. You can see how ridiculous, contradictory so-called science is. The fundamental fact and truth of why the grown man or woman does not need so much protein as the old physiology claims is shown in combination of mother's milk, which does not contain over 2.5 to 3% protein, and nature builds up with that the foundation of a new body. But the error goes further than that in their endeavor to replace something that is not destroyed, not used up, not consumed at all. As you learned in the previous lesson about the medical era of metabolism, the physiology has a principally wrong conception of change of matter because these experts, the founders of such kind of science, lacked all knowledge of chemistry at all, and organic chemistry especially. Life is based on a change of matter in the meaning of physiological chemical transformation, but never on the absurd idea that you must eat protein to build, to grow, protein of muscles and tissue. Most certainly not, for instance, is it necessary that a cow must drink milk to produce milk. A prominent expert of physiological chemistry, Dr. von Bunge, professor of physiological chemistry at the University of Basel, Switzerland, whose books do not endorse the average standing of medical teaching, says that life, vitality, is based on transformation of substances, foods, through which power, heat, and electricity become free and act as efficiency in the animal body. You will learn in the lesson about blood building that a certain change of matter happens in the human body and how protein is produced through transformation from other food substances. This change of matter takes place not by replacement of old cells by new ones, but that mineral substances are the building blocks of animal and vegetable life, and the replacement is of much smaller quantities than is now taught. The reason a one-sided meat eater can live a relatively longer time than the vegetarian starch eater is easy to understand after having learned Lesson 5. The first one produces less solid obstructions by smaller quantities of meat foods than the starch overeater, but their later diseases are more dangerous because they accumulate more poisons, pus, and uric acid. If you know the truth about human nourishment, and you are going to learn it later, you will be amused to note how physiologists grope in darkness, how they made up a standard quantity of necessary albumin for the average human which standard, by the way, is slowly getting smaller. They and even advanced diet experts estimate without knowing the great unknown, i.e. the waste in the human body. For thousands of previous years, humans have lived healthier without food value formulas, and I doubt very much if a single one of these physiologists ever gave their chef a suggestion of food values. The entire proposition is a farce, masquerading as a so-called science. A few like Professor Tittenden, found through experimenting that energy and endurance increased with less food, especially less protein. Professor Hind had proved that albumin need hardly be considered, and Fletcher outdid them all. He lived on one sandwich a day curing his so-called incurable disease and developed a tremendous endurance. After I had overcome all fears to the fatal consequences that would befall me if I failed to adhere strictly to scientific protein necessities, I found, experienced, and demonstrated the hitherto unknown and unbelievable fact that in the clean, mucus-free, and poison-free body, these foods poorest in protein, fruits, develop the highest energy and an unbelievable endurance. If nitrogen, the essential part of protein, is an important factor to keep the human machine running, if vitality depends at all on nitrogen, then it seems to me that under these ideal conditions, nitrogen is assimilated from the air. Food from the Infinite P. Power as a source of nourishment. What tremendous possibilities! I suggest that you read Lesson 5 over again and you will realize these two facts. Number 1. 
The Truth About Human Nourishment is still a book with seven seals to all humankind, all so-called diet experts and scientific experts included. Number 2. The Error of High-Protein Foods as a Necessity of Health, Taught and Suggested by Medical Doctrines to Humankind, is in its consequences and in its effect just the opposite of what it should be. It is one of the main and general causes of all disease. It is the most tragic phenomena of Western degeneration. It produced at the same time the most dangerous, most destructive habit of gluttony. It produced the greatest madness ever imposed on humankind, that is, to endeavor to heal a disease by eating more, and especially more high-protein foods. It is beyond possibility to express in words what the error of high-protein foods means. Let me remind you that the field of medicine claims as its father the great dietitian Hippocrates, who said, the more you feed a sick person, the more you harm him. Also, your food shall be your remedies, and your remedies your food. When we allow the body to become clogged with mucus and other foreign obstructions such as calcium, phosphates, and similar waste materials, we may expect to have high blood pressure overburdening the heart in its efforts to keep the bloodstream circulating properly. Lesson 7. Footnotes Number 1. Eret refutes the notion of nutrition. From Eret's perspective, the kind of attention that is paid to nutrition should be focused on the elimination of waste from the body. The word nutrition, circa 1550, derives from el nutritionum, nam nutritio, meaning a nourishing, from nutrier, nourish to, suckle. Here we see that the original notion of nutrition had to do with nourishment, particularly that of a mother nursing her baby, i.e., to suckle. Nurse is also related to nourish. Thus, the original concept of nutrition did not have to do with mathematical figures, which seek to define the way in which elements must be replaced in the body. It was more of a natural concept connected to the means by which a person, especially an infant, sustains him or herself. From an eritus perspective, the primary purpose for an infant to consume their mother's milk is to slow down or aid in their own elimination. It may also be observed that infants initially consume only liquids and must be slowly transitioned into solid foods. Contemplating this process may be helpful while learning the principles of the transition diet and fasting. Number two, this is a very important statement, as it simply and elegantly shows how wrong it is to think that we must eat dead animal flesh or drink animal milk to create human flesh. What cow needs to drink milk to produce milk? What cow eats dead animal flesh to produce its own beef? Cows are herbivores and will only eat grass if in the proper environment. Also, many primates will live on fruits only or fruits and herbs if in the correct environment. Many of these animals are not small, weak, or deficient in any way. Number 3. Russell Henry Chittenden, 1856 through 1943, was an American physiological chemist and professor. He is known for having conducted pioneering research in the biochemistry of digestion and was a founding member of the American Physiological Society in 1887. Number 4. Mikkel Hindhead, 1862 through 1945, was a Danish physician and a nutritionist, born on the farm of Hindhead, outside of Ringkeebing, on the Danish west coast. He was the manager of the Danish National Laboratory for Nutrition Research in Copenhagen, 1910 through 1932, and food advisor to the Danish government during World War I. In his research, he challenged prevailing theories about the amount of protein humans need to eat, and, as a practitioner, he recommended eating less meat and more plant-based foods. Number 5. Horace Fletcher 1849 through 1919, was an American health food enthusiast of the Victorian era, nicknamed the Great Masticator, from his strong arguments that every bite must be chewed about 100 times per minute before being swallowed. He and his supporters advocated the practice of Fletcherizing, that is, chewing each bite numerous times as well as a low-protein diet. See Eret's discussion of Fletcherism. Number 6, Book with Seven Seals, is a phrase that refers to or suggests some kind of secret esoteric knowledge, that is not easily accessible or understood by humans. Seven seals is a phrase originally used in the book of Revelation of the Bible, which refers to seven symbolic seals that secure the book, or scroll, that John of Patmos saw in his revelation of Jesus Christ. The opening of the seals of the apocalyptic document occurs in Revelation chapters 5 through 8. The New Physiology, Part 3, Lesson 8 Blood Composition the logical consequence of the first three errors of the old physiology is the problem of composition of human blood is not only what it should be, but also as a fact of scientific examination. The error is so great that it borders on insanity. 
The problem is this. Are the white corpuscles living cells of vital importance to protect and maintain life, to destroy germs of disease, and to immunize the body against fever, infection, etc., as the standard doctrines of physiology and pathology teach? Or are they just the opposite, waste, decayed, undigested, unusable food substances, mucus, pathogens, as Dr. Thomas Powell calls them? They are indigestible by the human body, unnatural, and therefore not assimilated at all. Are they, in fact, the waste from high protein and starchy foods, which the average user mixed eater of Western civilization stuffs in their stomach three times a day? Is what I call mucus the foundational cause of all diseases? Pathology proves that by saying that the white blood corpuscles are increased in case of disease, and physiology says they increase during high digestion in the healthy body, and that they are derived from high protein foods. This teaching is absolutely correct and the logical consequence of the error of high-protein foods. Medical science sees and must see it as normal conditions of health and that the non-sick must have these white blood corpuscles in their circulation because everybody has them. There is no person in existence in the Western civilization whose body has not been continually stuffed since childhood with cow milk, meat, eggs, potatoes, and cereal products. No person today without mucus. In my first published article, I promulgated the gigantic idea that the white race is an unnatural, a sick, and a pathological one. First, the colored skin pigment is lacking in coloring mineral salts. Second, the blood is continually overfilled by white blood corpuscles, mucus, and waste with white color. This is the reason for the white appearance of the entire body. The skin pores of the white people are constipated by white, dry mucus. Their entire tissue system is filled up and filled out with it. No wonder that they look white and pale and anemic. Everybody knows that an extreme case of paleness is a bad sign. When I appeared with my friend in a public air bath, after having lived for several months on a mucusless diet with sun baths, we looked like Indians and people believed that we belonged to another race. This condition was doubtless due to the great amount of red blood corpuscles and the great lack of white blood corpuscles. I can notice a trace of paleness in my complexion the morning after eating one piece of bread. This is not the place to bring up all of the arguments against this terrible error about the nature and function of the white blood corpuscles, believed erroneously by medical science. Anyone desiring a real scientific proof of this may read Dr. Thomas Powell's Fundamentals and Requirements of Health and Disease, published in 1909, a few years after my mucus theory was published in Europe, and later translated into English in 1913 as rational fasting and regeneration diet, neither of us knowing anything regarding each other's publication. Dr. Powell teaches in principle the same as I do. So far as the cause of all diseases, the white corpuscles and all these medical errors are concerned. The only difference being that he calls pathogen what I call mucus. In the method of elimination and diet, however, I differ principally and entirely from him. But even in the composition of the red blood corpuscles, the blood plasma at all, the blood serum, and the so-called hemoglobin, medical science lacks perfection. The two most important facts for us to know are these. Number one, the first is the much greater importance and vital necessity of iron in the human body. Number two, the second is the presence of sugar stuff in the blood. The great expert of physiological chemistry and mineral salts theory founder Hensel says in his book Life, iron is chemically veiled in our blood. Doctors could not find it through their lack of knowledge in chemistry. On page 36 of the same book, he says, In our blood albumin is a combination of sugar stuff and iron oxide, but not to be found or recognized, discovered, in such a way that neither the sugar nor the iron can be found by ordinary chemical tests. The blood albumin must be burned first to make the test perfect. I presume that the truth and importance is this. The red color of blood is the most characteristic quality of this quite special sap and is due to iron oxide rust. Therefore, it is self-evident how important iron is in the blood. Further, the sugar stuff is of high importance besides nourishing quality, as it is an essential part in the perfect blood hemoglobin, which, if in a perfect state, has to become thick, like gelatin, as soon as it comes into contact with the atmospheric air for the purpose of closing a wound. Read in my book, Rational Fasting, my test of a non-bleeding, immediately healing wound, without secretion of pus and mucus without pain and inflammation. One truth regarding the conditions of the human blood found out by doctors is that acidity is a sign of disease. 
It is no small wonder that this readily happens with the mixed eater, when they fill the stomach daily with meat, starch, sweets, fruits, etc., all at the same time. Try the following experiment. Next time you sit down to your Sunday dinner, have the menu served for an imaginary guest. Empty their portion in a cooking vessel using the same quantities as you are eating and drinking yourself. Stir thoroughly. Then cook on an oven at blood heat for not less than 30 minutes. Place a cover on the vessel and leave overnight. When you remove the cover in the morning, a distinct surprise will await you. Lesson 8 Footnotes Number 1. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a surge of medical researchers whose evidence challenged the newly developed theories of protein and albuminous foods emerged. In his book entitled Fundamentals and Requirements of Health and Disease, 1909, Dr. Thomas Powell, M.D., challenges what he calls the nitrogenous food theory. He states, this theory has enjoyed a long season of popularity, and yet it is an undeniable fact that the notion that nitrogen is the prime essential of food is wholly fallacious, having no other foundation than an erroneous supposition and a misinterpretation of facts, errors, which have led to a desperate misuse or abuse of the most valuable of all foods, Powell 41. He goes on to challenge the germ theory and asserts that albuminous foods play the most important role in human illness. The biologic, physiologic, and much of the dietetic and pathological teaching of this day and age is founded upon the assumptions that the white blood corpuscle is a living cell, that it is differentiated into the tissues of the body, that it is a phagocyte or germ devourer, and that the material in which it is found and from which it is formed is the physical basis of life. How 263. He then asks the following question. Is it not entirely reasonable to suppose that the motility of the white blood corpuscle is due to the forces not of life, but of death, to the processes not of vital duplication, but of chemical dissolution, that is, to the combined effects of chemotaxis, disintegration, and gaseous expansion? How 275. Howe's argument parallels Eretz by asserting that the leukocyte, white corpuscle, is not a living cell, but a particle of dead and perishable material. How 292. He adds that, the irony of the situation into which the leukocyte addendum to the cell theory has led us is not only perfectly discernible, but as cruel and relentless as the grave, since it is to the effect that the more tissue-building material, white corpuscles, the sick person carries in his circulation, that more pronounced is his debility and emaciation, and that the more vigilant policeman, phagocytes, he has to guard and defend him, that more certain and speedy is his destruction. Pal 294 for further reading, please see Powell the Cell Theory in Fundamentals and Requirements of Health and Disease, 263 through 294. Number 2. Eretz's proposition is that skin color and other physiological traits primarily reflect the degree to which a person is internally encumbered with waste on the cellular level. It challenges the popular notion that the radical physical morphology of humans occurred based primarily on adapting to non tropical climates further away from the equator. Number 3. To understand this statement, it is important to consider the role of iron in the blood. When iron that is mined from the earth comes into contact with oxygen, dark rust is produced, iron oxide. When our blood iron comes into contact with air, i.e. oxygen, it also rusts. Clean blood that is free of waste easily rusts when oxidized. To demonstrate this argument, Eric tells of his experiments with self-inflicted bleeding. He found that when he ate a mucusless diet for an extended period of time, a knife wound would heal immediately with no secretion of pus and mucus. He would also suffer no pain or inflammation. Thus, the oxygen would mix with the iron in the blood and rust immediately. However, when he ate mucus-forming foods, his wounds did not easily heal and he suffered from pain. He also became paler. This experiment suggests that 1. A mucusless diet promotes clean blood, 2. Clean blood is free of white waste materials, and 3. Clean blood becomes darker when oxidized. Given that blood becomes dark when mixed with oxygen on the outside of the body, to what extent does this happen inside the body? When clean blood is oxidized through the act of breathing, can it rust and darken? Hensel's argument may shed some light on these questions. In our blood, albumin is a combination of sugar stuff and iron oxide, but not to be found or recognized, discovered, in such a way that neither the sugar nor the iron can be found by ordinary chemical tests. The blood albumin must be burned first to make the test perfect. Eric summarizing Hensel's life, lesson 8. Consequently, the red color of blood is due to iron oxide, i.e. rust. Furthermore, the ability for red blood to become oxidized is dependent upon the absence of albumin, i.e. mucus-slash-waste. 
Eretz's perspectives on the nature of blood are controversial and challenging, but one does not need to initially believe in them to benefit from practicing the mucusless diet. Eretz offers a fresh perspective, and it is important to keep an open mind as you move forward. It is helpful to remember that Eret is a masterful philosopher of diet and physiology. As a philosopher, Eret's work questions and challenges the very foundation of Western dietetic theory and physiological science. Yet, in order to truly understand many of these concepts, it will be important to practice and experience the diet. Much of what Eret discusses tends to become self-evident through a dedicated adherence to his dietetic principles.